So can we just put those hands together, release a shout, release a hallelujah. You got a praise on the inside of you. Glory to the Lamb of God. If God has done something for you that you couldn't do for yourself, come on, hallelujah. It may have taken a while to get through the wilderness. It may have taken a while to get around the mountain. Come on, somebody. It may have taken a minute to get through the Red Sea. Come on. But God who is faithful has brought us through and brought us into the, onto the other side. Amen. When God says to come out of a place, it's because he wants to take you into a place. Amen. And God wants to take us into promise. And you know, sometimes before we see promise in, in manifestation in the earth, we will catch it in spirit. We will perceive it and understand it in our mind and in our heart. We will catch it in our spirit before it manifests. And you will live that dream out in your spirit over and over. It's almost like it becomes rehearsed in your mind. And you're meditating upon the thing that God said he is going to do for you. And every time you feel discouragement or doubt, hope will push you into faith. And faith will cause you to hold on to your promise saying, it hasn't come to pass yet, but yet the Lord will cause this to come to pass. Isn't that good news? That you know that God is not a liar. So amen. Father, we pray right now a blessing upon your word. I pray our hearts to open up. I love this season, Father. It is the season of rapid acceleration. Someone say rapid acceleration. It is the season that we come out with nothing and we move into inheritance. Increase the promises of God. And Father, I pray today that your anointing would rest upon us mightily. I pray that you would pour out abundantly. Increase us in faith. Help us in our unbelief. And Lord, help us to not doubt or waver in faith, but to hold on to the promises that are yes and amen in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to take today, I'm going to be talking about Ruth the Moabite. And I love this story because this story ties in so in sync with the Passover of Israel coming out of bondage in Egypt, passing through the Red Sea, come on somebody, entering out into getting ready to come to the place called Mount Sinai where God released the, the promises, the yes and the amen of God. Now, you know, it's one thing when God says, I want to bring you out. It's another thing when you see your challenge in front of you and God splits the Red Sea. We have obeyed instruction to a point. But have we obeyed instruction to the fullness of the full manifestation of the promise? See, one of the things is when we come out of, we came out of Egypt, Israel came out of Egypt, they only began to receive the preliminary instructions of what it was going to take to come out. But they hadn't received the fullness of instruction of what it was going to look like to enter in. And we love the sound sometimes of what it looks like to come out. But we don't know what it's going to look like when God begins to give new instruction to enter in. Mm. And so you have two different sets of instructions that are given. One to come out and another to enter in. And we can't treat the voice of God the same. They are, not, they are not the same instructions. Sometimes we like to hear instructions on what it means to come out. But our posture changes. Come on. Our position changes. Our mindset changes. Our heart and our attitude changes. Come on. And so I want to talk today about Ruth the Moabite. And this is a story that is read at the time of Shavuot. This is a time that is read that it's read from the Jewish people during the time of what we call Pentecost. And we just came through uh, the time of Passover. How many of us are glad that the Passover lamb has been slain? Amen. And that we know that even if we don't understand it, the blood is on the doorpost of our homes. The blood is on the doorpost of our heart and our mind, our spirit. And even when we don't know what to speak, the blood is talking. Hallelujah. How many of us are glad about that? I am glad that the blood speaks. So we're going to talk about Ruth. Now we know that 
Ruth came into being a part of Israel because she, she named, married a man named Malon. Malon was the son of a Jewish man named Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. Now, they came out, according to the story in Ruth chapter 1, they came out. Elimelech had taken his wife, Naomi, and his two sons, Chilion and Malon, and he had entered into the land of Moab. Now, it's ironic to think that you would take your family out of the land of promise and take them into the land of your enemy. But let me tell you something. When God is trying us, come on, God was trying the nation of Israel. Come on, he was trying them. It's easy sometimes in your challenge to begin to dip out. It's easy sometimes to say, you know what? It seems like my enemy got food, mm -hmm, but the people of promise don't. And so he raised up his family, he uprooted them, and he took them into the land of Moab. Mm. Well, guess what happened? While he was in Moab, of course, he has two sons. And so now these two sons, of course, are going to want to produce a family. And so the one son got him a wife by the name of Orpah. The other son got him a wife by the name of Ruth. Mm. So we see Malong and Ruth Mary and Chilion. It's like Chilion. I always say, I'm going to get my chili on. That's how I remember it. I'm going to get my chili on. And that these now become a family. But what's important is we have to ask ourselves a question. Because Elimelech had went into Moab to preserve his family because there was food there, did he take on the ways of Moab or did he hold to Jewish custom? Did he hold to the Lord God of Israel even though he was in the land of Moab and over the centuries Moab had actually exercised dominion over Israel? There were times and seasons where they would tax the Israelites and they were cruel and they were harsh to them. Was he taxed to come into Moab? Was he tried as an Israelite to enter into an enemy territory? Mm. We don't know the whole backdrop of what he had to go through to enter in to preserve his family. But what we do know is these two daughters, these two daughter-in-laws, in order, one of two things had to happen. Either he compromised, and when we read the story and we read in all of the old covenant, God was upset every time Israel would actually intermingle with the Moabite women. Mm-hmm. So it leaves us with knowing that Elimelech was a man of God. He was a man uh, who was, was, uh, had, had actually a position in Israel. Mm -hmm. That there had to be maybe another part of the story that we don't understand in order for him to release these two women to his sons. And it would be that they would have denounced the Moabite ways. So we got to understand, where did the Moabites come from? They were descendants of Lot, who was Lot. Lot was the one who made it out with his two daughters. And they had incestuous relationship with him because he truly thought everyone is dead. So we better procreate. And now they had a son named Moab. And that was the beginning of the Moabites. When we begin to study out and we see through time and history, the Moabites were similar to the Ammonites. And the Ammonites and the Moabites had, a, had gods that were very similar. The Moabites worshipped Chemosh. And Chemosh means a destroyer. Come on, somebody. It means one who, who uh, uh, is suppressive, mm -hmm. a subduer, fish god. Mm, a fish god. Come on. It was very similar to Baal worship. It was very similar to Molech, requiring at times sacrifice human sacrifice and we can find that in scripture where they sacrificed to chemosh but they were also we have to remember they were like israel but they were not the same as israel remember abraham and lot were cousins 
But just because somebody's of the same lineage doesn't mean that they're of the same DNA. They don't mean they don't act the same. They don't talk the same. They don't walk the same. Come on, somebody. Jesus rebuked them in John chapter 8 and said, you serve your father, the devil. You're descendants of Abraham, but you're not children. Because if you were children, you wouldn't act this way. You wouldn't, you wouldn't say, I have a devil. Abraham didn't do this. So that shows me you have a different father. Though you're laying, laying claim because you want the promise. Mm. So you want the promise more than the God of the promise. You want what God can give you more than the one who's giving it. Woo. Okay. So it'll be a time. So we're looking at this backdrop of Moab. And these two women. Now what's interesting is we won't find this in your Bible. You got to dig a little bit. Someone say dig a little bit. You got to go and get you some historical references like Josephus, the antiquities of the Jews. You got you to be a devout reader. You got to love history. Come on. And you'll find out if you'll study history, history will complement the Bible. Mm-hmm. And what we find out is there's now more to this story. That these two women were not just Moabites, but we find out from history they were sisters. And not only were they sisters, they were sisters of royalty. Their father was king of Moab. Oh, now that, now that really begins to change the narrative when we find out that there's something going on. Someone said there's something going on. See, Ruth was the daughter of Iglon, king of Moab, who had oppressed Israel for 18 years. You can find that in Judges chapter 3, verses 12 through 22. And Eglon was the son of Barak. Anybody remember who Barak was? He was the one that hired Balaam to curse Israel in Numbers chapter 22. Hmm. So now we have to ask ourselves, how is it that according to history, two daughters of royalty become wives to Israelite, an Israelite man? That man must have had some money. He must have come out of Israel with something. Let's go into the narrative of the story. What do we find out? We find out that Elimelech dies and the two sons die. We realized, according to Ruth chapter 1, that there was no children produced in those marriages. And when we get into the rest of the story, and it comes time, we find out that Naomi's like, can I produce children? I have nothing else to give you, daughters. I have nothing else to give you. Will you hang around and wait? Until if I could perchance have a husband tonight. Till I can produce another son for you. You're not going to hang around. You're not going to wait. But see, God has a way of taking a negative. Taking something that looks like it should be an absolute end. And producing a miracle. Looks like it should be the end of the matter. Sometimes in our life, it looks like it should be the end of a sitch. That's it. I'm done. I'm washed up. It's over. This is the end. But see, we're going to find out that God's ways are not our ways. And we're going to find out that there were some things that even Ruth's and Orpah's generations prior had done, even though they were wicked kings, that God said, even though you were wicked I still have to honor what you honored. See, we don't understand it, but because God is righteous, and there are times when wicked people will honor God, God cannot bypass his own honor. And he has to return a reward on the honor you gave, even if you were wicked, because he cannot deny himself. Woo! 
So now what we find out is in the generations previous that there were things that were stored up in heavenly places that God said, I'm looking for a place where I can release back onto a generation into the earth because even your wicked parents honored me in a way and I need to return a reward because my, my word doesn't return void. And we know you reap what you... Mm-hmm. This is why we can't understand how sometimes somebody can live so shysty, shoddy, any kind of way, and it seems like, man, they look like they're more blessed than me. And there are times that God is saying, look, I'm trying to show them that because of who I am, my goodness is going to surpass their wickedness. My goodness is going to overtake their ungodliness. If they will allow themselves to really see me as high and lifted up. Come on, somebody. And God is not sometimes rewarding the person. He's rewarding the principle. See, we, we don't know how to discern. Did God reward the person or did God reward the principle? And because they put a principle in operation, God said, I have to honor the principle. And we mistake it as thinking that God honored the person. See, favor is different. Mm -hmm. Woo. Okay. So we find out. Now, what we find out was that Barak tried to win God's favor by setting up altars in Numbers chapter 23. He sacrificed unto God. Now, God still didn't, at that time, receive what he had offered up. But nonetheless, according to the rabbis, heaven took note. Mm -hmm. Eglon, when in Judges chapter 3, you see that it came time for him to die, Ehud comes and he says, I have the word of the Lord. But what we don't understand is it says that Egon stood up. Now, I want you all to take note of that. It says Eglon stood up when he heard Ehud said, I have the word of the Lord. And what is documented by the rabbis is that because he knew enough to stand up. Heaven took note that even at the end of his days, just before he was about to die, he had enough something in him to honor God. He honored even at the point before he was going to be murdered, if you will, or killed because of the oppression that he had released upon the people of God. His honor went forth. And it went forth looking for someone it could pour out on. And it would be his future generation called Ruth. So now somehow, by coincidence, twist of fate, Holy Spirit leading, this woman who is a Moabite princess ends up the daughter-in-law to Elimelech and Naomi. The father's gone. Her husband's gone. Naomi now tries to convince, go back. Go back. I can't do nothing for you. But see, there must have been something. Because the thing that we find out, it says Orpah, when we read into the scripture, in 1 and 14, Orpah kissed Naomi. But it says Ruth clung to her. In the difference on us being positioned and prepared for the greater. Someone say prepared for the greater. The term is determined on whether we kiss or we cleave. Because, because if you kiss, you can leave. But if you cling, mm -hmm, it means I'm holding on. See, Judas kissed. Mm -hmm. But when you cling, I mean, I'm holding on. I'm not letting go. Jacob wouldn't let go. Come on, somebody. 
We got to come to a place. I don't, I don't want to just show you I love you by giving you a kiss. I want to show you, God, I love you by holding on. Hallelujah. And so we find out Orpah kissed, but Ruth clung. And we find out God found him one that he could bless. Ruth said in verse 1 and 16, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back. Someone say, not to turn back. back. Mm -hmm. From following after you, for wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Now, some people say, at what point did Ruth choose to really be like the Israelites? I believe it came at the time when a betrothal took place. And a lot of the writers historically believe that in order for her to be brought into the family of Elimelech and Naomi, they already had to have renounced Moabite ways. So if they had already, because if she hadn't renounced the Moabite ways, she would have been quick to return saying, truly, the Lord God of Israel isn't with us. Let me go back to Chemosh. Let me go back to what I know. Or did she see something? Because even when Naomi says, my daughters go back, even in the beginning, Orpah said, no, let me go with you. But then she persuades. So Orpah got persuaded, but Ruth couldn't be persuaded to turn back. What is your experience? What has your encounter been so far? Where is there to go back to? And when you look at the story, Naomi says, and behold, she said, look, your sister in verse 15 has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. No, I'm not going to go back. It's also believed that maybe Naomi was protecting Ruth and her sister. Because when you read in the scripture, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, this situation seems impossible. It seems beyond human comprehension that God, that anything good could have come out of this situation. Because when we reread in Deuteronomy 23, in verse 3, it says, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to what? The tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt. They added harshness. We remember that all the way back to Edom, even the Edomites wouldn't let Israel pass through the land. They were hard. They were, uh, they were abusive. Sometimes when Israelites were trying to flee, different enemies would sell them into captivity. And God remembered. Because listen, they were also supposed to be of the same family. But you didn't treat them like family. Whoa. As a matter of fact, you're you're just like the Ammonites. You're You're not blood. You're like the Ammonites, idol worshiping. Come on, somebody. Woo. And because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you, Now listen to this though. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because what? The Lord your God loves you. Whoa. The Lord your God loves you is upset with the Moabites Mm -hmm. and they can't enter in. 
And it's thought that perchance Naomi may have known if I take this woman with me, if I take these women, they're not going to be very welcome in Israel. Go back. But nonetheless, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. And whatever I need to go through and whatever I'm going to need to endure to let your God be my God. And I meet a generation today, they're not sure about holding on to God. Come on, somebody. They're not sure about who should they hold on to. See, there's some things that we need to understand. Like the Lord even has put it in me even more that because I was blessed with a wife and I was entrusted to take care of her, that how much more should I honor the ones who raised her and brought her into the earth and released her into my charge. Mm. It's a big responsibility. And honor we're missing in this generation. Ruth chose to honor, honor God and honor Ruth because now she knew Ruth was all by herself. I'm sorry, Ruth, yes, thank you, hallelujah. Ruth knew Naomi was all by herself. How many times are people left by themselves? How many times do people feel like nobody's left for me? No one's going to care for me. Who's going to tend to me? Who's going to see about me? And when honor rises, and one of the things the Lord was dealing with me about is if we want to go forward, we've got to honor the past. Mm-hmm. I want to say that again. If we want to go forward, we must honor the past. Meaning we must honor those who preceded us even in life, in ministry. Sometimes we feel like because we're on the cutting edge and I got this and I got that, we don't, we don't want to honor because we feel like there, we got these terms called old wineskin. You're an old wineskin. But what we don't realize, if we'll honor the old wineskin, God has the ability to produce a new cluster. Mm-hmm. Woo. We doing okay? So are we going to kiss or cling? And what we find out is when Ruth and Naomi return to Bethlehem, Judah, Bethel, the house, they moved back to the house of bread. It says in the scripture that they came back at the time of the barley harvest. Now, what's beautiful is when they return, the whole city is rejoicing, saying, is this Naomi? Is this, and what's amazing is Naomi's name, I believe, means beautiful. Beautiful, if I remember. But she's like, don't call me beautiful. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. Don't call me beautiful. That's that name is someone I once was. That's not who I am today. Coming back here to the land of my husband and I. Coming back with nobody. And I'm coming back with this woman who's chosen to follow me. Who's not of lineage. Who's not even according to the customs welcome. Don't call me beautiful. Call me Mara. You can read that in verse 20 in chapter 1. Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And sometimes we'll want to put a label on us based on a temporary situation. Anybody ever been there? You feel like your situation's going to last longer than you can live. You feel like you're going to die in that situation. And you'll begin to put a label on you that God ain't even put on you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we find ourselves feeling like Job when it says he scraped himself with the pieces of broken pottery. And sometimes we find ourselves to be comforting ourselves with broken pieces of our past. We're scraping just some kind of comfort. If I could just something, I can't endure this. That's where we find ourselves. 
If I can encourage you, don't put a label on yourself that God didn't put on you. Because circumstances and situations are only temporary. But conduct and attitude can become permanent. I won't say that again. Circumstances and situations can be temporary. But conduct, attitude, character can become permanent. You can find yourself now to be etched in a permanent character based on your response to a situation. And you'll live that out the rest of your life, cycle after cycle, every five and ten years, wondering why doesn't anything change? Nothing will change until we take the label that God wants us to take and produce the character. Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. And so we find out that through the story, it says that they came back at barley harvest. Barley harvest is a representation, someone say, first fruits. Now, what is first fruits? First fruits is what we find out that after Passover, when we move into the season of unleavened bread, we find out Christ was the first fruit of many brethren. And what it means and symbolizes is that after a season of harshness, abrasiveness, cold, no growth, we now begin to see the budding and the coming forth of new life. Someone say new life. And Jesus represented as the first fruit, come on somebody, the firstborn of many brethren, he represented the new life that was coming forth after generations of spiritual death. And Naomi and Ruth come back into this season, they come into this place in the season when the whole city would have been celebrating. It was the barley festival, hallelujah. It was the barley festival. Come on. Hallelujah. And they would have been celebrating and rejoicing. It was the season of new hope. And they would have known. And so when they came back, they came time, they came back at a high time of celebration in the region. They couldn't have come back at a greater season. They knew that if in the season it represented redemption. In this season, when they came back, it was the season just after Passover. Come on, somebody. It was the season when it was believed exiles and outcasts were returning. They couldn't have come back at a greater time. When the whole city, and the Bible says that the heaven rejoices over one repentant sinner. It's the equivalent of heaven rejoicing when a person who was on the outside now decides to repent and come on to the inside. So now they're coming back. There's no animosity. There's no anything where they're pointing the finger saying, Ruth, you left us. You and your husband left us. You went out from us. You weren't of us. No, this was a season of saying, it's in gathering. It's a season and a time for you to come back. It's a time for you and God has allowed you to leave for a season. Now it's a time. And who did you bring with you? I bet the whole town was into gossiping. Because we find out later when it comes time and she gives this instruction we're coming back with nothing Ruth but the law of Israel allowed in the barley harvest when it came time we can find in Leviticus chapter 23 that said don't gather all the gleanings don't reap the entire field leave the corners for the poor so when they come they may have something to eat how gracious is our God that he won't he won't, if someone was willing to get up and go get the scraps, he said, you'll eat today. Come on. How many of you can hear that? If you will get up and at least go and get that which has fallen behind, you can still eat. I'll make sure you're provided for. Is that good news? I promise you. And one of the things we find out is the Bible says that Ruth dwelt with Naomi from barley har the beginning of barley harvest until the end of the wheat harvest. And that meant she was with her from the time of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, that season right there, all the way to Shavuot. And this was the season that was known by all of Israel when they came out of Egypt and God gave them rapid acceleration 
So it wasn't a time for you to experience loss. It wasn't a season for you to experience sorrow. It wasn't a season to keep dwelling in the past uh, and, and, and talking about the old thing that happened. It was a season to experience acceleration. It was a season for preparation to go forward and now get ready to receive the word of the Lord. They understood in this season of Shavuot that it was the giving of the Torah. It was the giving of promise. And then it was this, as God gave it, we celebrate our ability to receive the word of the Lord. See, God gives, but do we celebrate? And can we say, I've received what you said? How many people can say, we know God gave the word. We know that God gave commandments. We don't need to keep reiterating that. What we need to do from heaven's perspective, we need to look and say, who received what the Lord has said? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Who can say, I obeyed. Ooh, I received, I obeyed. Is this okay? So they were there in that time. And we see the instruction from Naomi go down to Boaz in the midnight hour. You know, the custom was that if a landowner had servants, that one of the servants, what they could do, they could actually come and lay at the feet of the master. And if the master feel fit, he would take a piece of his garment and cover them, but they weren't allowed to go no further than his feet. They had to be mindful of their position. Naomi gives instruction to Ruth, and she comes in, and where does she find herself? She finds herself at Boaz's feet. He now begins to give instruction. Come on. Let's go to Ruth chapter 2. One of the things, now it happened at midnight that the man was startled in Ruth 3. And turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? She said, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you're a close relative. Now, what's interesting is the progression that God uses to bring a person from the outside to the corners to bring them all the way in through process. See, so when we read in the story in Luke, I mean, Luke, hi, Ruth chapter 2, one of the things is, the story of Ruth has already gone throughout the land. When we read in Ruth 2, it says, Boaz answered and said to her, it has been fuller reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and mother in the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Now, he pronounced in, Luke, in Ruth 2, the Lord bless you. One of the things we find out is Boaz was a man who knew the power of blessing. Because when we see the story in, in the beginning, it says that he blesses his servants. And they say, the Lord bless you. Now we see Boaz, because he hears about Ruth in her mannerism her character she shows up in his field gleaning says it's already been reported to me what kind of woman you are character precedes blessing it had already been reported what kind of person you are Woo. she didn't show up just demand saying listen I have a right for someone to redeem me she went through a process through humility. And before you knew it, she had gotten counsel and insight. And Boaz steps up to the plate and says, okay, let's do this. Now, he fulfills his part as a righteous man according to the customs of Israel. And he fulfills the role of kinsman redeemer. That's what our Christ has done. That's what Messiah has done for us. 
he has fulfilled a role to bring us in so that we're not left on the outside with nothing. Abandoned, familyless, no one to care about us. It says he puts the desolate into families. Come on. Ha, ah, glory. Woo. Character precedes blessing. And we see the whole story in Ruth chapter four of what the process looks like. And he says, listen, there is someone closer than me, but if he won't do it, I'll perform it. Now, what, do I, what did I say earlier? The thing the Lord has been putting in my spirit is we can't honor the past. We can't prepare for the future. There has to be a generation of prophetic people that can bridge the old and the new. Or if not, we, what we have is a gap in between and we, now we have factions and division. And I've had to repent of this, not realizing that in some of my zeal, I was actually doing the work of the enemy. Come on, let's just be real. Don't realize I'm perpetuating something. Wow. Honor. And so we find out. Let's go to Ruth chapter 4. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Verse 13. And when he went in to her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in Israel. Now they're prophesying over her. Now they're speaking blessing. But notice it says that he has not left you without a close relative. Wow. The Lord has raised up someone that you could call family. We miss the fact that God in the beginning said to Adam and his wife, be fruitful and, which means family. And we'll find out a lot of healing will take place when we produce family. The very simple instruction that was found in the beginning still brings healing today. It brings purpose. It brings identity, relationship, things that help hold us together. You ever meet someone that has doesn't have a husband or a wife, they have no kids, they seem aimless. They don't know where they should go, who to hang out with, but when you meet people who are solid in the Lord that have family, and they got a spouse, and they got kids, they know their stewardship. They know what, the, they have purpose outside of just function because they have relationship. Oh, it's easy to function in a gift Especially when it's people you don't have to see but once a month. Right? Mm-hmm. But how much more being like a Ruth who endured with Naomi. She didn't say, you know what? My daddy's a king. My family comes from a lineage of kings. I could easily go back to the palace. Or maybe she couldn't. Maybe she would have had to endure ridicule to go back to Moab. We don't know. But she chose to go back, and we find out now, through her serving and cleaving, she received an inheritance that she wouldn't have received back home. Uh-huh. Why? Let's go on. And may he be to you a restorer of life. Now, this is prophetic. May he be to you. Obed means servant, workman. May he restore life to you, Naomi. Now, I want you all to check this out. And a nurture of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Now, I want you all to catch this. Sometimes we see the older generation as finished. But do you know that if you give identity and purpose back to the older generation, a woman is proven that she can begin to lactate in the presence of babies. 
You know what that means? Even though she hasn't produced in her own womb, she can begin to get ready to produce milk, which means now she nursed him. Come on, somebody. She began to produce milk and she nursed Obed. Restore. She now, as he gave life, come on, purpose, now a flow begins to happen through her where she's now nourishing and sustaining his life. Is that good? Hallelujah. Woo. Also, the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, there is a son born to Naomi. Who was the son born to? Why didn't they say Ruth? Because it was through the kinsman redeemer restoring the honor back to her husband who bore the son. Come on, somebody. A son has now been raised up to Naomi. And we have to question, what are we doing that helps produce not just for the future generation, but for the generation we say we're looking back at? Are we producing for them that helps produce purpose for them? Are we helping produce sons and daughters for those who feel like there's nothing left? And if we'll get that picture, I'm telling you, lay honor. I don't care. I don't care if we feel like they're as religious as the Pope. There's power in honor. And just as the kings of Moab in their hour tried to, their, in their most wicked state Try to figure out a way to honor God. Woo. And God was able to find him an heir out of the Moabites. Come on. Here's what I love. Elimelech, Eli Melech, El, means my God is king. And the prophecy was, may he be a restorer of life. And we all know Obad gave birth to had, had a son named Jesse and Jesse had a son named David who is the lineage of the king of kings who said I am the way the truth and the life come on is that good news hallelujah so just as Boaz redeemed Ruth our Messiah redeems us and he's now going if we'll cling to him and we'll cling to the right places We'll cling to the right people with that heart. What we're going to find out is we're going to see a production of life. And the greatest thing that we can release is life. Love, light, come on somebody, and life. If we'll release those things, we'll see generation healed. And we'll see gaps and breaches restored where there previously were walls. Yeah. And there was schisms and division. We'll see more healing. More deliverance. And we'll see trust. Come on, hallelujah. What kind of, what kind of, what kind of blessing came on Ruth? That she was now named in the genealogy of the Messiah with five other women who should not have been named like Rahab. <laughs> come on a harlot come on and she's named in the lineage of the true king the king of kings and the lord of lords I believe in this season from Passover to Shavuot every year in this season I believe for those that will cling to the Lord and remember where he brought them out from and what he wants to take us into, I believe in this season that there is always rapid acceleration. You will not understand why all of a sudden they're shifting. Sometimes it's external and sometimes it's internal. You'll feel yourself catch up with something that God showed you and you'll feel like all of a sudden like you grew up overnight. And you'll feel it happen on the inside, Jesus growing up in you, and yet you'll have a hard time explaining to the people around you. Because it takes a while. Because the people didn't shift. You shifted. 
God shifted you. Oh, hallelujah. Is that good news? Come on, hallelujah. Let's lift up a praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we believe.